Hey, how's it going, Last in Line Nation? Uh, glad you could join us for another episode of Kingdom Business for the month of November. And we are wrapping it up with uh, this episode. And we've got a special guest today. And I just want to say uh, this is going to be a good perspective, as I say about all the episodes, because everybody's got a different perspective. But, but this guy, I've gotten very close with through our church and serving there and leadership and, and he's seen this from both sides of the fence. And he is really kind of a picture. His career is kind of a picture of what the intent was when we thought of this, this theme of kingdom business and balancing our faith in the workplace and really understanding how we reflect that and how we walk into certain, I guess, hostile environments from a spiritual standpoint and how we can, really shine a light and set the tone there. And so I'm going to introduce Derek Thompson, who is a personal friend of mine. Uh, we, like I said, work, he works currently as a pastor at the Art Church in Conroe, Texas. Um, he is in charge of all the adult groups and ministries thereof. Um, we worked hand in hand on, on doing men's discipleship and creating curriculum. Um, but Derek also worked in the secular business world uh, for 20 years with Cardinal Health and was in management there, uh, operations, logistics, and really knows what it's like to walk into a business where you're leading people that may not always be like-minded as you and know what challenges are there. So Derek, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. Man, it's been, it's been a fun ride with Derek. Um, is, is there anything about your background professionally that maybe you could kind of give us some context as to some of the, the things that you sort of faced in light of what we're talking about before we dig into the meat of this outline? You know, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, and, it's, and it's, when I look back, it's, it's pretty interesting how uh, my experience uh, there at Cardinal, how it reflects what I'm doing now. Um, and ultimately it came down to, you know, being someone who, a, a leader of people, you know, uh, going into an environment where, you know, you, you have to really help people to, you know, see the be to be able to see beyond where they're at in their current situation and, and yeah. move to a certain goal uh, yeah. and move into, uh, you know, um, move into a place where you, you can experience success and victory. You know, really, uh, when I first got to Houston area, the Houston facility, uh, our, our organization was really struggling a, a lot. And, um, you know, the very first thing that I had to do in there was really, you know, get the group to book, start believing in themselves and, and, and realize that, you know what, it was very easy to turn it around if we all work together to accomplish mm -hmm. a goal. And then, you know, when you translate that to ministry, it's about really helping people who are struggling understand that, you know, if, if, you, if you make some small changes, you can experience success in life as well. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really, it's really been a fun journey, you know, both at Cardinal and, and at the Ark Church. That's good. Yeah. It's amazing how there are some parallels and, and <clears throat> it really feels like even though we're not vocational ministers, sometimes we're in ministry outside the four walls of the church. And, and I think it's, it's important to understand that as leaders, because sometimes we feel like, oh, well, I don't know that I'm really making a difference because I'm not quote unquote a pastor. So, I mean, I, ha I may have to draw a line in the sand between my secular job and then who I am when I go to church. And really there's a bridge there that, that kind of streamlines all that and kind of molds all that together. And it's who we are as people. And we take that wherever we go. And that's the beautiful part is there's people that I see in my job that will never meet a Derek Thompson who is a pastor, you know, and, so I am a reflection of that, and I'm a reflection of my faith to that person. So what we're going to talk about is setting the tone here in our workplace. And we've talked about it for a few weeks now, and Derek's got a great perspective. So the setting the tone, the T-O-N-E, the, the first, the T is the tempo. And elaborate a little bit on what you started to talk about there, because as a leader in secular world, in the business world, um, we have to create that tempo right. and it starts with how we carry ourselves and what example we're setting and how we get that trust from those people and the buy-in there. So talk about, I don't know, maybe some of the things you had to really be conscious of 
daily to set that tempo. Yeah, it's interesting you said that. Uh, you know, I, I, I've always wanted uh, to be in full-time ministry, but uh, I had to realize that there was a season where that wasn't uh, going to happen for me. And so, you know, I would say for the first five, uh, maybe even 10 years of, of my career there at Cardinal, um, you know, in, in my time at home away from, from the job, I would always complain to my wife, complain, uh, complain to myself about not being able to do what I wanted to do. But then I'd say around year eight or nine, I had a perspective change realizing that I could still, you know, bring some type of positive impact there mm-hmm. in the corporate world. Yeah. And, and so when you talk about developing a rhythm, you know, I, I think it all started with what you just said, John, you know, uh, you know, how do I model uh, Christian values? How do I model who a, a man of God should be? How do I model those things in the workplace and bring a positive impact? So it started for me, with really starting out and having quality time with the Lord and my, you know, myself. And, and what that looked like was, is really spending time reading his scriptures, reading the word. And what I found is, is uh, out of that, you know, I was able to gain some, some wisdom, some clarity, some direction. Um, it made me more creative. And so I was able to really go in uh, to the, the organization with, clear understanding, clear, you know, clear eyes to be able to see where the issues were, the problems were. I was inviting God in to the workplace. He, he was kind of the one now leading me and driving me and, and helping me uh, to start moving things in the right direction. And then uh, what I found was, is uh, in there, you know, I kind of talked about it being my mission field. You know, these, these are the people that God sent me to, to really uh, bring an impact. And, and it wasn't about preaching. I didn't have to preach. You know, it was about modeling the values, uh, Christian values that had been instilled in me in my everyday uh, job. You know, every, every time I got onto the, to the, the campus there at Cardinal, you know, was I encouraging people? Were I lift, was I lifting them up? Was I speaking positive to, into their lives? You know, it's funny, my director, the guy I worked for, he had this, this saying, you know, things are bad, it is what it is, and, you know, all, all I need to do is survive for another two years and, you know, I'll be good. But I remember you know, reading a scripture early on in my career here in in Houston. And and there's a scripture that says everything is subject to change, you know, with God. And, and so I I didn't go into the the, the facility preaching, but what I did was that I took that phrase and said, guys, you know what, everything's subject to change. If you'll, if you'll link up with me, if we'll join and do this together, God, God, I would say everything is subject to change, you know, and inwardly I'd be saying, you know, God, God's going to bless us. And, and what was I doing? I was casting a vision, casting a, a big vision, help painting a picture that guys, we might be uh, at the bottom from a, uh, you know, a score rate from a statistical standpoint, but incrementally, if we'll, we'll do small things, eventually we'll get to a place where we'll experience success together. And so I, I would cast vision, you know, collectively as the group. And then I would get with the individuals and I would say, okay, here's your piece of it. As a, as a warehouse employee, this is how you help us to, uh, you know, accomplish this vision. As a inventory control clerk, this is how you help us accomplish that vision. And so the big picture, you know, with, with it being in the medical supply industry, our big picture was, you know, helping patient receive quality care, not sending boxes to a hospital. But I, I painted the picture of, hey, guys, every box you send is going to touch a patient. Mm-hmm. You know, what if that was your mother? What if that was your daughter, your, mm-hmm. your grandmother? And so that was the big picture. We want to provide quality care for the patient. Yeah. And then I would say, and then as you're picking those orders in the warehouse, understand, you know, the condition it's in, uh, if we get it to them ti- in, in a timely manner, you know, it's all going to affect that care that they get. And so mm-hmm. I cast the big vision for the group and then I would cast that individual vision uh, for each employee. Mm. <clears throat> That's really good because then you've got stakeholders all of a sudden. You've got people with skin in the game. And especially when you shed a light on the ultimate person that's be- benefiting from that one particular task that they're doing, because that can seem monotonous over time and finding a purpose within that's hard. So I can only imagine, you know, what you're talking about is is a, a really good strategy you had. But I can only imagine that that didn't go exactly as planned every single day. So no, not, not, not at all. What do you, what did you, what were you up against kind of when you walked in? Was it, 
I, you know, I use this term, this whole, this whole session of hostile environment. And I say that to say maybe not everybody agrees or is like-minded with us from a faith standpoint. So what, you know, kind of describe that hostile environment a little bit, because I know it wasn't easy every day. So man, you talk about a hostile environment. So my first day there, uh, these guys had a pool back in the warehouse with, it said new manager on there and they were taking money bets on how long I would last. And I, I think the, the one that was going the strongest was he would last for, for, for six hours and be oh. out of here because that facility had a reputation oh. of just high turnover in management. Um, and so part of it was management drew a line between them and the frontline employees. Mm. And so it was kind of an us versus them kind of mentality. Now, having had experience in, in um, warehouse work, you know, I talked about spending time with the Lord. I talked about him giving wisdom, giving clarity, giving direction. One of the things that the Lord really impressed upon my heart was is to get in there and create a team environment, meaning, you know, I wasn't too good to do anything in that building. And so when I came in, uh, in that environment, they were working 22, 23 hours a day. I mean, it was just nonstop. You had tired employees, you had frustrated customers because there were quality issues. You had, uh, you know, huge contracts on the line. And it was all because management had that us, is, us versus them mentality. The management would go home after eight hours, but frontline employees were working 20 plus hours. It was crazy. And so that first week, you know, I, I came in there with that strategy and I rolled up my sleeves and I put on some, some steel toe boots and I got in there with those guys mm. and they thought I was nuts. I mean, they, 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 thought, they said, what are you doing? They never my seen whole that thing was, guys, we're in this together. And so yeah. right there, that broke the ice. Yeah. You know, they, were, they, they saw me there. You know, we were there 20 hours. It wasn't like I turned everything around that first week, but we were there together sweating. We were tired. We were frustrated. But it let them know that, you know what, I'm going to be down in the trenches with you. And then as I started doing that, I started to set expectation. I said, okay, guys, we're going to start out. We, not, we may not be able to handle this time issue that we're dealing with, but we're going to focus on quality first. We're going to make sure that what the customer orders, the customer gets. And I started putting in quality practices mm -hmm. uh, in there. And then when we achieved our qual quality goals, we might still be working a lot of hours, but if we achieve those quality goals, I celebrated the employees. Mm. It, it was something that never, had never been done before. And then the, 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 the other thing, I mean, there did several things, but I think the other big thing was is anytime things went wrong in, in that facility, management was always quick to point the fingers to the, right. the frontline employees. Yeah. But anytime anything went right, the manager was going to dinner with a customer. The manager was, you know, getting a, 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 an award for the facility. And so mm -hmm. I flipped it and I spoke openly and said, guys, if things go right, I'll celebrate you. And if things go wrong, I'll take the bullet. And I did that. I, I, I modeled it. I lived it out. You know, mm -hmm. I, I said it and I did it. And it won me a tremendous amount of respect. And, uh, you know, it wasn't anything. By the time I left that facility, I would ask those employees to, to jump off the roof and, and, and they would do it because they knew I had their back and, and, and they knew that, you know, I was someone who meant what he said. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's uh, in a nutshell, what you just described is, is leadership, you know, one oh one or it should be leadership. One oh one is getting them in the trenches, earning that trust. And you did it however you, you saw fit. And, uh, you know, did they understand who Derek Thompson was when he came through the door? Did they understand from a core values, from ethical marching orders? Did they know who you were and, and did they understand? And, and did you set that? And I guess you just lived it out basically instead of telling them who you were, they could kind of see that. I, I, I lived it out, you know, because there, there were common practices in that environment that people always did, you know, at, at, at the end of the week whether they were management or the frontline workers, you know, um, they would get together and they'd go hang out at the bar. They'd go hang out at the, the strip club or, or they would, uh, you know, be out there talking bad about their, their wives. Or mm -hmm. so, and so for, for me, there was something different. People would ask, how come I wouldn't get involved in those conversations or how, why I wouldn't go out mm -hmm. to the bar with them or, or, or to the strip club with them. And mm -hmm. that was just an opportunity for me at that point to open up and say, you know, I really don't believe in those things. You know, I, you know, my, my faith, my belief in God, you know, as I read the word of God, it, it, it sets kind of a, a foundation that I truly believe in 
and, and, I, and I'm not willing to compromise those things. And as I modeled that out, lived it out, not hit them over the head with it over time, you know, it gave me an opportunity to speak into their lives because this same guy who was saying all these things was not here judging them when they were doing those things. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would say, hey, man, you know, whenever they talk about, hey, I'm having marriage problems, you know, I'd say, hey, can I speak into your life? You know, would you allow me to, you know, give you some advice? And, and I would give them advice based on scripture. And I think the fact that I didn't judge them, I think the fact that I was in the trenches with them yeah, al- allowed me to speak into their life. And, and they, they realized that I had their best interest in heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's great. I mean, sounds like so you poured a foundation early on with them and it took time to really establish that and to of course get them to the point where you said they would jump off the building for you that didn't happen overnight so you know as we shift gears to the the o of setting the tone and go into obstacles you know today's leadership in in mainstream corporate america some folks would argue I think the, there's no faith in the workplace, but I would say during the times that we see now, I believe that the gap is being bridged even more so now. And I think there's a hunger to see godly leadership in mainstream workplace. And so what would you say are some of the obstacles though, as a leader listening to this, that feels like there's an opportunity to ex- exhibit and ex- be an example and show that faith in the workplace and really be that voice of stability for their, their team. What, what are they going to face? What's going to be a huge obstacle to bridging that gap? I think, so for me, I think one of the biggest obstacles, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to be strong in your faith when you're at church or strong in your faith when you're on, around your family. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you get into an environment where, um, uh, let's say the company values and the company culture is, is different and it, and it comes against the word of God, what, what God says, that's where the challenge lies. You know, I, I think about the environment I was in, the environment I was in, people were resources and, mm-hmm. and that was the extent of it. They were resources and if the resource didn't work, then you moved on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and scripture tells us people are, are the priority, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so you've got to figure out how to navigate that, uh, in, in, th- in that environment. And for me, it, it all starts with um, knowing, you know, knowing what the word of God is. I, and for me, everything goes back to the word of God. It's like, you know, how, how, how do I handle this? How do I, how to deal with this? You know, and um, I, I believe that if, if you'll incorporate um, what scripture says uh, in, in your, not only in your personal life, but, but there in the, in the job arena, that it will help you to be able to still model the values of God and respect the culture that you work in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest, op- that was the biggest obstacle for me. Things like, you know, um, like we, we don't, you know, the company I came from, they didn't celebrate Christmas. They celebrated happy holidays, you know, mm-hmm. um, they, they, someone could come in and they could be sitting in there looking at uh, a bikini magazine, but, in, in open areas, me being in management, I couldn't read my Bible in a break room or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So working through uh, how, to, how do you navigate those things? And so, uh, you know, I, I would, you know, I, they, they said I could go out and sit on the picnic table outside and, and read my Bible, my Bible study. So I would go do that, you know, and um, wow. guys would be like, hey, why are you out here? And I said, oh, I'm just, I'm just doing a, a, a you know, simple Bible study devotional time. And, and then after a while, guys would say, hey, can I come sit with you? And then look up wow. you know, a couple of months into it. We're doing a Bible study during lunchtime, not mm-hmm. because I'm trying to organize something. It's just guys want to gravitate out there because they enjoy being around me. They enjoy uh, my company. And now I'm able to openly uh, talk to them about the scriptures. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, staying in the scriptures, a- asking God to, to give you kind of clarity and, and direction of, of how you need to respond to the, company values and the, and the culture that stares you in the face got to give you some, some different ways to deal with things. You know, um, mm-hmm. you know, I remember having to deal with people when, whenever it came to dis- disciplinary reasons and even having to terminate people, you know, for me, it wasn't a uh, callous thing. It was, Hey, can I, can I speak into your life? Can I help you here? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and they would say, sure. And I'd say, Hey, unfortunately here, here, here's where we're at. 
and here's why we got here, you know, and, and we've been having regular uh, meetings to this point. And, and, and from a standpoint of uh, the company, we're going to have to make this decision. However, let me just speak into your life. And I would yeah. talk about the good I saw. I would talk about the gifts I saw. And, and then I would really encourage them about the days ahead, you know, and so I would make that, that separation from the company kind of mm. more humane as opposed to, you're not, you're no longer with us. We, you know, we don't need you anymore. Get your yeah. things and leave kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Cause you said earlier, you just said that, that sometimes the company culture is views people as resources and right. a, a number on a ledger. Right. And as a leader, especially a faith-based leader, it's important to view those people as more than resources and be, you know, they, they are people that bring value that have gifts that can accomplish great things. And, and I think as leaders, it's our job to expose those gifts and empower them and let them know, Hey, you know, in, through encouragement, constant encouragement, even though they may not be, um, uh, in that perfect place, you know, right now, and they may have a really bad outlook or they may not be, fully utilizing their gifts, but it's our job to bring those out and to show them that they do have value and they're not just a number on a balance sheet. And, and that's a big deal because you said it, you hit the nail on the head with the, the company culture doesn't always, isn't always so inviting of you as a faith leader being at your desk reading your Bible. Like sometimes that's frowned upon. So right. rather than be a leader that's trying to go in and force change I think it's just a matter of living who we are and not compromising those values. And then eventually those people start coming to you. Those opportunities start kind of unfolding and, and exposing themselves to where you can speak into somebody's life. So I think if we, where I got into a, a sticky situation as a leader was I thought to, to be a, a Christian, I would go in and I would change everybody. Right. And I yeah. would speak life into people and be an example, but I would also try to fix people in my mind. And, and I think that's a, that's a trap we get into is thinking we got to go in and be the solution to every, everybody's life or everybody's lost journey, you know, in a spiritual standpoint. I don't, we don't need to fix people. We don't need to solve problems. We, we are there for that, but, but I think our goal has to be different. It has to just be how do we live that life? in the workplace and be who we are and not change, which, yeah, John, I think what really helped yeah. me was, is, you know, realizing that I'm going to stick out, you know, the, the Bible tells us that we're a lamp, we're a light. Mm. So yeah. when a light or lamp goes into dark places, it's right there. You it's see right it. there. And, yeah. and so how you, how you live out your life, how you model leadership, it's going to stick out. Mm. And, and and so you don't have to preach you don't have to change it i mean it, it's like let it happen naturally yeah. you know that, that that's what i learned is is is, is let god uh, allow it to happen naturally and and so i just just walked out his values in my own life every day you know and it was me trusting in him knowing that uh he was going to i, I guess help me to be that light in that environment Mm -hmm. all of a sudden made my witness that much more stronger yep. and it drew people to me. I'm talking warehouse workers. I'm talking sales reps, it's just different people. People always saw there was something different about Derek. There's, there's something that's there and to the point where some of the most hardest cases God allowed me to speak into their life. And, and, you know, some are serving Christ today. Some are not serving Christ, but some made some minor adjustments along the way because mm -hmm. I was able to bring some positive influence and not be judgmental or not, not be yeah. condemning in, 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 in any way. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, you just lived it out. And, and that kind of leads us into the end of the setting the tone. You know, we've covered the tempo, the obstacles, and now the non-negotiables. And I would ask, based on all that you've just said, there may be somebody thinking that's watching this. Okay, practically, you know, how do I walk in and, and really what are those non-negotiables about me that don't waver? Cause that's what we want to, that's really what, where the rubber meets the road with our faith in the workplace is what does not change about us because we can be either transformed right by our environment or we can definitely help with some of that transformation by how we are different. So what are the non-negotiables for Derek Thompson 
when you were in secular workplace, what, what were those things that just the main things were the main things and they didn't shake? Right. I think number one, first and foremost was integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, in the environment I lived in or, or worked in, um, there, I was asked to do a lot of things, even some things that were mm -hmm. not so good, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I, I made a decision that I was going to take a stand, take a stand for truth. And, you know, if it got in, in my mind, it was like, if it gets me fired, so be it, but I am not going to cross certain lines. Yeah. Um, and so it, it put me in some uncomfortable conversations and un uncomfortable positions, but, but God protected me every time. Mm. And the, the second thing was, is I, I don't know if we realize it sometimes, especially when, as you move up in management, sometimes it becomes about performing so that you can obtain that next level, that next position, that next raise, that next bonus. Yeah. And I found myself getting caught up in, in reality, what it is, is people pleasing, trying to perform to impress the director, trying to perform to impress the general manager and, and really getting caught up in the, the bonuses, the, the new assignments and, and, and all of that. And so I think uh, a non-negotiable that I learned and, and had to implement very quickly was, you know, again, there's another scripture that talks about doing everything unto the Lord. Yeah. So realizing that what I was doing was not for my director, was not for the general manager. I was doing it because I was representing the Lord in the workplace. And I wanted to, to, to give the example that someone who is a Christian can be the best employee of, of a company, can be the best manager of a company. And so those became my two non-negotiables that really helped me actually move from performance-based to really a, 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 a time of peace. You know, I found that when I was performing, I was always stressed out, dude. Always, always trying to figure out, you know, how do I really get Bob to recognize me? How do I really get right. to this point where I can catch up with, with Kenny, you know? And, and, but then when I moved to just, let me just focus on representing the Lord well. Let me just, man, there was a peace, there was a joy. I didn't bring issues home to my family. It, it just complete turnaround in my life and it really helped me. That's huge. And, and let me let the audience know too, when you hear about how Derek did his, how he, how he strategized and how he implemented, let me just tell you, Derek's a competitive guy. Like, <laughs> let's, not, let's not gloss over the fact that Derek had this beautiful plan and every day was rainbows and, and roses. Yeah. So Derek's competitive. He, you know, we're not saying you, you don't strive to, you know, compete and do well, but we're saying, you know, the, those affirmation, um, the barometers of your success are not the people around you. It's right. Did I walk this out? Did I live what I'm talking? You know, am I walking what I'm speaking? But, but don't kid yourself. We're, we're wanting to succeed and be, you know, we're, we're wanting to be number one. Like this is right. not a passive philosophy. I mean, I, there was a year that I was number one sales rep in the company in out of a hundred reps. And man, I was for the last three months, I'm watching that leaderboard. You know, I'm watching, I'm not working for that, but I'm watching it and I'm, I'm sprinting to get there. And I got there. So, you know, audience leaders that are listening, we're not saying that you don't have goals and you're not competing and you're not, you know, making a way for your family. Of course, what we're saying is, it's got to be the driving force has got to be more than just about comparing yourself to others and getting affirmation from people. It's about representing your faith. Is yeah. that, you have anything else to add to that? No, I, you know, and, and what I found was the difference for me was, is when it was about the competitive side, the driving side, I was using people for myself. Yeah. When I yeah. flipped it, it became, you know what, we're in this together. And, 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 and when we win, you know, yeah. we all win. And so, yeah. you know, yeah. I, it really helped me a, a great deal uh, in many different ways. And, and I think you said it well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're both, we, we, we want success, but we want to do it the right way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so those are the non-negotiables that, that kind of come with it, the integrity, um, you know, just understanding, and I always call it the audience of one. And I try to go back to that sometimes because if I get back to grounded and realizing that number one, any success I have is going to be based on the favor 
of the Lord in my life. It's going to be based on him honoring what I have chosen to honor and my principles and values. Like that's not all because of how great I am. Right. It, right. So, so if I, and I get back to that and understand that audience of one, so God and really representing him, I think everything falls into place and, and we do have responsibilities in ways that we walk this out. But um, what are, what are mistakes that leaders make? If there's a leader watching this, what are some of the mistakes or traps we get into aside from, aside from just keeping up with Kenny or getting my boss to send me an email that said I did a great job? Are there any other kind of blind spots as leaders that, that maybe we, we walk into? I, I think the, uh, a big a trap is uh, believing that your gift, I mean, it's it, like, it's all about you that, you know, realizing your gift that comes from God, not, not realizing your gift comes from God. Yeah. But, but not, not being able to get over yourself thinking, you know, it, it's all about you. The reason yeah. there's success, it's because of you and what you're bringing to the table and, you know, um, and, 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 and not really understanding that it's he, it's God who gives you the ability <clears throat> to produce wealth, to be successful. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, kind of getting that big head and, 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 and um, I think that's a big trap. I've seen a lot of Christian leaders fall into traps because they haven't gotten over themselves. They think they're the best, best thing in, in, in sales or the best things in management or the best things in ministry. And they get caught up in the hype and, you know, as quickly as they rose to, to the top, it's just as quick, as they fall into the bottom because they they've thought it, it was all about them. That's right. That's a good one. I forgot about that. I mean, that's one that's kind of an obvious right there in your face too, that we, we think about our pride and we think about just kind of being about us. I, I didn't even, it's so obvious that it slipped through the cracks on the discussion. I'm glad you mentioned that because there, there's somebody watching that is trying their hardest to implement this Christian value system within the workplace. And it's, it's hard, it's challenging, but they're also having success and they're thinking, well, you know, I must be doing something right. Cause I'm the man. I mean, yeah. you know, if you look at my bonus chair, if you look at my status in the company, I mean, I'm the, yeah. I must be the man. Right. So yeah. uh, I don't know. I, I think that's a trap. I, I call it the <clears throat> Dallas Cowboy syndrome. Uh -oh. You get caught up in yourself and, and, and you realize you're, you're really nothing at all. Uh-oh. We had to go there. All right. <laughs> I'm a Cowboys fan, but, you know, hey, we're, we're horrible. Yeah, well, I, that's a whole other topic. But, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me. So, I, you know, we always round it out um, in this discussion. We always talk about how do we quantify what good looks like. And we always want to talk about the E in setting the tone, which is evaluation. So what were some checkpoints you had within yourself during that process of management and leading people in the workplace environment, even now? I mean, even in ministry, let's not, let's not, you know, try to make the mistake to think that work because you work in ministry full time, that everything's perfect. Um, but, but talk about how you evaluate and it may look the same in both sides of the, the workplace environment that you've been in, but cause it's really about you checking yeah. in with yourself. So do you have a system? Do you have you, do you have a way to evaluate kind of what good looks like? Yeah. You know, for me, it was all about the environment. So I, as I said, when I went to Cardinal, Cardinal was, you know, uh, the Houston facility was not in a good place. And so it was all about creating a, a, a good environment, creating a safe environment, a place where people wanted to come to work, a place where people wanted to, uh, to, to give their all, uh, a place that would be uh, peaceful, enjoyable, you know, where people could reach their potential and, and could grow. And then uh, a place where they could model the example of the leaders who were in front of them. And, and so that's how I measured success. I, I, you know, I, I took my focus off of the numbers and I put them on the people. And so if, if people were developing, if, if the culture was right, if um, I saw people growing, you know, my, my belief system was, is, the bottom line numbers would be effective positively at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that proved to be true. And, and so now even in ministry, my whole thing is, is I want to create an environment where people enjoy coming uh, to, to be a part of our team, to be a part of our, our ministry, 
create an environment where people grow uh, and, and people experience success in their lives and, and create an environment where other people are now doing what I'm doing, where they're affecting people in a, in a positive manner. So that's kind of how I evaluate that, things. It's not yeah. about the number, it's about the, about the people. That's really good. That's really good because you can, I mean, you can look at it and quantify that when you see other people pouring into somebody else that you had poured into and um, environments do look like when you change their complexion, you can notice it, right? right? When it, when it's dirty and when it's clean, you can see the difference. And I think that's a great, and, and that, like we said earlier, it, it is not overnight. Like you were there a long time and you know, for those people, just a little off script, uh, for those people that are watching that, like, could you give an idea of how long it took? Like, was it, you were there a long time. So it took you a few years yeah. or a few months yeah. to kind of change that? So, so it, it was, a, it was a, a gradual change. And so I kind of took the approach that, that uh, Jesus took in the Bible. But if you read leadership books now, if you've heard the 80-20 rule, yeah. you know, I, I focused on it. I looked around and said, who are the top 20% here in, in, in this company, in, in the warehouse? Who, who are the top performers? And so I spent a lot of time modeling and, and, and casting vision and, and spending time helping to groom those individuals. And, and what I found was, is then there came a point, maybe two, two and a half years in, where they began to help me do that. I said, I would challenge them. Hey, who are two or three guys that you can spend a lot of time with to help get their quality here, help get you know, their, their performance here? And, and so we just began using multiplication and, and doing that there at the facility and it really helped us. And I would say by year five, we had really turned things around and we were, we were going strong. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's discipleship in the business world, basically. Why did you say that? I was, that would took the word. I was my next word. That was perfect. I was going to say that's, I mean, discipleship 101. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's pouring in and multiplying and, and watch it, you know, just spread. And that's what we're doing. Not that, not that everybody we're in corporate America with, we're trying to build into a manager, of course, but everybody does have leadership abilities. We've said that everybody's got influence. So therefore everybody can lead. We are right. wired to lead. So if we, as the leader of that team, pour into those, like you said, the 20%, that's a great way to, because you do have to take bites of this process, right? And the right. way you do that is with identifying those 20% who you feel can have the most influence and then spread that rather than you having to go down the list of 20 people, right. Take those, you know, those two and, and get, or, you know, and, and try to get down uh, or those four and try to get down to spread that throughout the team. So um, the last question I have for you is what I ask everybody. What is Derek Thompson's, leadership footprint going to look like when we get down the road and we look back and we see where Derek has walked, what's that footprint going to look like? What are we going to say about your leadership style? You know, I, hopefully it's, it's that he was an investor in people. He helped people, uh, one believe, believe in the fact that, uh, there was something valuable on the inside of them and that they could make it make a difference in this world. And then two, that he was able to replicate um, his heart and his philosophy of people helping people. You know, um, you know at the end of the day, I, I believe life is about people. It, you know, it's not about the houses. It's not about the cars or, or the, the investment account. I believe it's about people. And I believe at the end of our days, you know, when, when we leave this earth, it's going to be how did you impact people? Uh, in, in your life. And, and so whether it's in a, in a, a secular setting, whether it's in ministry, you know, I, I you know, my, my desire and my hope is, is people will say, you know what, he was a, a great influence of, of, of people. He, he, he really cared about people. He really loved on people. Um, he really believed in people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it would, it would be hard to argue that if anyone watches this to, to say anything else, after hearing your heart and hearing you speak about it, it's clear that people are and currently where you are now too. I mean, that's really what it is, right? That's, 
that's what drives is, is people um, that you lead in ministry. Um, is there anything you could say to the Derek Thompson of 20 years ago, if he was sitting in front of you, getting ready to go into management or leadership or start this journey? Is there anything you could say to that guy that maybe you would want him to be aware of or that you would say, hey, this is, aside from people, of course, but this right. is what you want to really make the main thing. Yeah, I, I would say um, enjoy the journey. You know, I think sometimes as leaders, we want to arrive. We, we, we want the success. We, yeah. we, we want the titles or we want the position. I would say enjoy the journey because when you look back along the way, you realize that you've been able to really accomplish some tremendous things and, you know, engage with some tremendous people and, 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 and be a part of some, some wonderful opportunities. And I think sometimes even like, like, you know, when you go on vacation, sometimes we're so focused on the destination mm -hmm. that the journey getting there is stressful. It's the same way. You know, I, I, I think we just need to learn to relax where we're at, take it one day at a time and, and enjoy those, those, those moments, enjoy, you know, those, those opportunities and, and, and allow uh, it all to play out um, over time. Yeah. I would even say enjoy small victories. Yeah. along the way because yeah. sometimes our, our barometer and our gauge of success is so big and, and, and so inflated that we go through our day and, and compilation, you know, these days that accumulate and we feel like we're not getting there because we have this, like you said, the destination in mind, or we have this huge elevated goal. You know, I mean, just, a day, a daily victory is something I had, I had to get to that perspective because I was going to go crazy yep. if I was still focused on that. Okay. I've got this many people who I've made into managers. I've got this, this number that we've hit and we're ranked yeah. here for the year and we're going to be ranked here next year. You know, instead of, man, I got Joe to, you know, finally do this task that we've been talking about for two performance reviews in a row. You know, yeah. or it's it's one of those where you, you really, like we said, take one bite and really enjoy that small victory in your day, in your week. Break it down to being granular because I think if we – when we put all those together, obviously they become a big they, – they, they multiply into something big. But if we got to take those little steps and those little bites to really – because there are those small victories, right? I mean – yeah. In, in your day, in your week. I mean, I think it's important to gain that momentum because otherwise, man, we can really get, we can get on that hamster wheel and we can really feel like we're not going anywhere. Right. Right. No, you're right. Yeah. So, Hey, uh, I mean, I've enjoyed this time, of course. I mean, I, I know Derek, I get to hear Derek's heart on a regular basis. So I, I felt, uh, you know, I felt like it was my duty to share that with you guys because he's got a really good perspective on being in ministry now, being in corporate America before. And like he said, he always wanted to be in full-time ministry. He felt like that was where he was going to be, but he had to really be faithful to that journey where he was, where God had planted him. So I, I think that's a good takeaway as well is if you're listening to this is, you know, be faithful to where you are right now. Be a good steward of where God has you planted or rooted right now. And God expands that. God will multiply that. But but you really have a purpose where you are now. And, you know, those people you're leading right now may never hear uh, what faith is. They may never see what faith looks like without coming across your path. So really enjoy where you are. Derek, man, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for making time on a Saturday morning. Um, Thank you for sharing your heart about the Dallas Cowboys. That was impactful <laughs> to the listeners. Uh, but no, I really did. I think we got a lot of good stuff out of this. And I hope folks wrote some of this down. But, uh, you know, we're going to start a new, a new series in December. And I think it's going to be powerful. But I hope Kingdom Business has empowered you uh, to really be, you know, uh, exhibit that faith. Don't be, don't be afraid of it. Don't shy away from it. But also go live it. Um, and you will watch people gravitate towards you because you will be different and it's a good different. And that's what I say. Be abnormal, uh, be abnormal and represent your faith um, the way that you know you're called to and God will honor that. So until next time, 
Be blessed.